Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We're going to explore the nature of good and evil today. With me is neuropsychiatrist Dr. Vernon Neppe, who is also a specialist in forensic psychiatry and uh, behavioral neurobiology and many other specialties relating to our topic. He is the author of a book called Reality Begins with Consciousness, co-authored with physicist Edward Close, which is a cosmological theory of everything, including consciousness. But relevant to our subject today, he is also author of a book called Cry the Beloved Mind. Welcome, Vernon. Thank you so much, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Your profession of psychiatry certainly has a lot to say about the nature of good and evil. It does and it doesn't. Mm. It's amazing to me that good and evil is often put right under the carpet. And when people commit evil acts, or are so to say evil, they're just regarded as mentally ill. And this is something that I think is mm -hmm. distressing. Well, there is an ethic, I think, in, as, as a psychotherapist myself, there's an ethic about being non-judgmental when you're dealing with a patient or a client. Yeah, it's true. You want to be non-judgmental, but unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't mean to say that one should label anything that is evil as not a consequence of the person committing the evil mm -hmm. and therefore say they are mentally ill and uh, un that's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, we in the common vernacular, you often hear people say, uh, that's sick. It's hard to conceive of a normal person committing an evil act. Yeah. And that possibly is where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Our whole society, our whole organization, you does hardly recognize that there's such a thing as good and evil. Mm -hmm. There's no axis in psychiatry pertaining to good and evil, and this is one of the aspects that I maintain should be there, an axis six, a good and evil axis, quite separate from some of the other axes in the so-called Bible of psychiatry, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, currently mm -hmm. in its fifth edition. I would hope the sixth <laughs> edition has that axis six. Well, uh, in speaking of the Bible, that's really where we get our notions of good and evil, wouldn't you say? I think that's a very, very good spot to begin, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a concept that we find in theology. It's a theological concept. It's difficult to translate into medicine, into psychology and psychiatry, and therefore it's much easier to say, well, mental illness, or as you pointed out, sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it's a whole question mm -hmm. pertaining to responsibility. It's a question pertaining to obeying others relating mm -hmm. to taking away one's own responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's a question of acting when we need to act. So all of these are linked up. Mm -hmm. It's certainly in, in the law as a forensic psychiatrist. Uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with legal standards and we, we don't talk about good and evil, but we do talk about criminality and, uh, yeah. If you break the law, that's a crime. Yeah. Which is and the, differences in mm -hmm. terms of quality of breaking that law. Mm -hmm. You know, the same shooting can lead to a murder or the person can miss and the consequences are different. Yeah. But of course, in a way, one might look at the action, mm -hmm. the intent is the same. Well, and the, the uh, intent is often hard to see. I mean, many many times it's hard to tell uh, good and evil. For example, uh, we uh, it's been about eighty years now since the Second World War, maybe seventy. Uh, 
people think of uh, Hitler as the epitome of evil. Yeah. Would you not say if you wanted an archetype of evil, Hitler is, comes to mind or Stalin or Mao. These people killed millions of, of other innocent lives. And, and yet uh, there are people who regard them as heroes. And this is the introduction to another component, the component of the politics of evil mm -hmm. and how the people in those armies or working with the Hitlers of the world were acting and how they could be regarded sometimes as evil and the few who did the protecting, trying to rebel, trying to help as the righteous. Yeah. Now, I did an interview not long ago with Thomas Lombardo, a uh, psychologist, about the nature of evil. And he pointed out that sometimes, and I suppose the case of the Nazis would be an example, the evil is so great, we have no choice but to endeavor to exterminate it. But in doing that, we end up committing acts of evil ourselves. It's, I suppose that's why Christ might have said, uh, resist not evil because you become like what you resist. Yeah, there's this whole balance. Mm -hmm. And I had early exposure to this balance. Yes. Yes, you participated in some of the uh, important psychological research initiated by Stanley Milgram at Yale relating to uh, how uh, naive people can so easily be uh, conditioned or even seduced, one might say, to following orders, following instructions, and committing acts of uh, if not evil, at least inflicting great pain and harm upon others. That is true. And it I was in my teenage years, I was already well into medical school, and I'm on the campus of the University of the Witwatersrand, and somebody comes along and says to me, do I want to participate in a psychology experiment? And I'm most delighted, and I go along, and I'm told, this is the effect of punishment on learning, mm -hmm. and they, we draw a from a hat and I become the teacher clearly I think every piece of that hat was teacher but never <laughs> mind and I'm told that I have to shock the student who I'm then introduced to mm -hmm. so there was a personal component and yep. then the student is put in another room and uh, I'm so supposed to progress through giving higher and higher levels of shocks. And you you could see the student through a one-way mirror or something? No, I could not oh, at that point. I see. I could only, I was introduced to him, mm -hmm. and then I knew he was in a different oh, room, okay. and I was going to teach him, and initially I... he learned his tasks, and then he didn't. Uh -huh. And this was a dilemma for me, because... Oh, Vernon, you've got to shock him. Yeah. And I said, I'm not going to shock him. And I was told, but you've got to shock him. You volunteered. Mm -hmm. And we had this whole little debate going on. And when I did not shock this other student, in came this beautiful young lady who drew closer and closer to me and said, but you promised, please shock him. It's, you don't want to mess up the experiment and, you know, uh, <laughs> three inches apart. And so there was this seductive component as well. And I don't know if this was a variant of the methodology yeah. because as I'm reading it in mm -hmm. these famous Milgram experiments, there were 20 different variants, yeah. including the Milgram work. And many replications. Yeah. Many, many replications right around mm -hmm. the world. Yes. And eventually, after 10 minutes of cajoling, they gave up. And somebody came along and said, Phew. Do you know you are the first of 49 people we have tested who has not gone through to give, I don't know, 720-volt shock? 
And I and gather in some of the research you could see the person writhing in pain. Yeah, they would replicate <laughs> this and the person would be, because once I was watching this, I was let into it mm -hmm. and screaming in agony yeah. and saying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And then there's silence. And I was so shocked by this. I said to them, look, you've got the wrong population. And I knew that in experiments it had to be random individuals. I'm not yeah. sure how randomly I was chosen anyway. Mm -hmm. And I said, my friend Stephen, he's a pacifist. At least you'll get somebody else objecting. <laughs> so Stephen came along and an hour or two later he came back and I said, well, I'm so pleased now, Stephen, there are two of us. And he looked at me and he said, what are you talking about? And I said, you didn't go through and shock the student. And he said, of course I did. And I said, but what about when he screams out in pain? Well, you know, he volunteered and too bad. <laughs> he didn't even realize this wasn't real. Yeah. And he went it was through. an actor. Yeah, of course it was an actor. Yeah. And I said to myself, hold on. This is an example maybe of evil obedience, and people have used it as a parallel with yeah. the Holocaust. Yes. How did the Nazis and the a German army managed to do these atrocities and just follow it through. And uh, I, in one of my publications, used the word evil obedience, mm -hmm. which I'm sure is not original, yeah. but this was what was happening. But this was one example of the evil. And when one of the uh, testers said to me, you know, at least you know how you reacted. I would like to think I would have reacted like you, but I don't know. Because statistically, overwhelmingly, the people will follow the instruction and inflict uh, life-threatening electric shocks on, that they believe are real on uh, unsuspecting volunteers. Yes. And some people have written books on this. There have mm -hmm. been several. And one has said, well, maybe only 50% believed it was real. We don't really know. But mm -hmm. even there... It's a rather remarkable figure. Even if it were only ten percent, it would <laughs> it would be frightening to think that ten, you could just. Well, Hannah Arendt, the um, philosopher, wrote a book called *The Banality of Evil*, in which she pointed out that largely the Holocaust uh, happened because of bureaucrats, faceless bureaucrats, who who were managing the logistics. Yeah. And, of course, she wrote about Adolf Achman as well and mm -hmm. the Achman trial in, I think it was the 1960s, was paralleling these experiments. I mm -hmm. think this is what yeah. Stanley Milgram was originally motivated by. Mm -hmm. So, a very interesting component. Yeah. So, that was one of my first exposures to evil. Uh -huh. and, it, and what it has to do with is, I guess it's the uh, mindset of people who are willing to accept whatever an authority figure tells them they need to do. Yeah, and it takes away their responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, that was exposure number one. Mm -hmm. If you want, another epiphany was many years later when I was training in psychiatry and I was referred this patient who was probably about 19 or 20 at the time and he rather proudly told me about the fact that at that point he had committed six or eight murders mm. and he would laugh about it and he would not only murder his victims, he was part of a gang and would generally be an opposition bang, gang that would be the victims. Mm -hmm. He would hang them from a tree and he'd pull out their nails one by one. And this to him was really very, very funny. And he could never get caught because there were three or four of them and they always acted as alibis for each other. And... At that point in time, I was anti the death penalty. Mm -hmm. I was anti capital punishment. But after I was exposed to this individual who I felt at this stage should be hanged by the neck until he is dead, so to say, yeah. I became pro capital punishment. Mm. 
I diagnosed him, and he's the first and only person I've diagnosed, and this fitted into forensics as well as psychiatric terminology as a high-grade aggressive criminal psychopath. And his whole history was that of mm -hmm. a high-grade aggressive criminal yeah. psychopath. Then I came across laws, and this was all around the world, Poor person, he's a psychopath, he can't help it. This ought to be a mitigating circumstance. And I've always felt he cannot help it. His responsibility, this to me, became an aggravating circumstance. It certainly became an aggravating circumstance in terms of rehabilitation, mm -hmm. because these people cannot as easily be rehabilitated. To my knowledge, when it comes to uh, psychopaths, now I believe they're called sociopaths, uh, we don't have a cure. Right. And a lot of these people mm -hmm. are therefore labeled mentally ill. Yeah. You know, and then we use this fabric of access to personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And there's mild personality disorders or personality dysfunctions, and there are profound and severe ones. And one uses terms like psychopath. And, of course, Cesaro Lombroso, way back the sociologist, yes. spoke about this whole uh, inborn component. Mm -hmm. And then people would say, well, you know, it's just purely the environment. Mm -hmm. And that's where star people started using terms like sociopath. And I tried to differentiate out that term. And I remember being exposed to somebody else who was diagnosed as a sociopath, and uh, his therapist came along and said to me, well, you know, poor guy, look what happened when he was a child. Look at the events he went through. Mm -hmm. And then another therapist came and said, I went through the same kinds of events, and look how I've turned out. And so this leads to a whole new fabric mm -hmm. of experience and responsibility. It's very controversial even today about uh, the insanity defense and yeah. uh, the, w whether people who are mentally ill still should be held accountable and responsible for their uh, moral uh, behavior. Of course, and this leads to another example. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a rarity. I'm trying to get across the idea that even though the press loves to write about the fact that he was mentally ill and therefore was capable of doing these things, mm -hmm. most of the mentally ill, if they do have acts of violence, of acts of violence against themselves, for example, suicides or attempted suicides, mm -hmm. they not generally are murders. No. However... I was referred in a forensic context, a tragic young lady. She was a school teacher who really had an infertility problem and finally she fell pregnant. Mm -hmm. And she was so excited, delivered her child in a hospital and suddenly in the middle of the night woke up and murdered all the children in that nursery. There were about six. Oh, my. And some of the staff tried to restrain her, and they described her as like she had Superman strength. Nobody could get near her. She was as wild as anything. And eventually she was restrained and referred to a mental hospital and ended up, as one could imagine, regarded as unfit to stand trial and not responsible for this. And she said to me, I woke up, and it was God who told me to commit this. Mm -hmm. And after I did it, I realized God was not evil. It had to have been the devil. And she had never had any psychiatric history. Yeah. And the question, of course, came up later on, because she was ultimately released from hospital, whether or not she should have been sterilized after this postpartum event. But the important point here is you're not dealing commonly with psychiatric patients who commit these terrible atrocities. You generally are dealing with people with significant problems. Psychopathy is one. Mm 
And we sometimes see this in people who have borderline extremes mm -hmm. in terms of perceptions, uh, not the usual borderline personality disorder, uh, but who is very intense, but some of those who can commit crimes. But the point that I'm making is axis six. Introduce a good evil axis. Do not condone such behaviors and allow that axis six diagnosis to be on its own. In other words, so-called ordinary people who commit evil acts are also part of that axis. Now, there are some people who would take it quite literally in this case and say, yes, the devil is real and she became seduced by the devil and those voices are diabolic. And as a psychical researcher yourself, uh, there, there might be a case to be made for the existence of demonic entities. Yeah, one could debate that. And I have certainly seen patients who not fit the usual fabric of psychiatric labels. Mm -hmm. And uh, at times we used to call this multiple personality disorders where their behaviors are quite different during different phases or dissociative identity disorders. Psychiatry has some wonderful bits of terminology and mm -hmm. it changes terminology the whole time. The easiest way, there used to be a joke that the easiest way to not get a diagnosis of schizophrenia was to go across the Atlantic and maybe be regarded as bipolar. Mm. And it's a whole <laughs> fabric of ideas yeah. that I have that you've got to look at pharmacological responsiveness. Yes. We spoke about those psychopaths. And strangely enough, some of them can be helped. They can be helped with appropriate medication because a small population of them have abnormal electrical firing in the brain, generally in the temporal lobe of mm -hmm. the brain. And when they are given anticonvulsant medications to put out the abnormal fires, they become very much more likable. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, a lot of psychopaths are very, very likable. Yeah. This is part of their charm. But my points here are one, have an axis six, and mm -hmm. that axis six is not only for psychiatry, mm -hmm. but have it for general population. Two, don't label our mentally ill as they dangerous, they evil, that's not fair on the mentally ill. And three, something I published, wow, approaching 30 or 40 years ago maybe, at age 25, it's amazing, but never mind. But it was called Fame and Assassination. Mm -hmm. You'll remember there was the attempt in Reagan's life. There was yes. an attempt round about then on Queen Elizabeth's life. Oh, yeah, life. many of these people are doing it because they think they'll become uh, notorious. Yeah, they are achieving their own places in history. And very often the media cooperates. Right, and so... In one of my recent papers, mm -hmm. I've said a man was arrested. Uh, he was number 16472A. Mm -hmm. And that's all. You don't, <laughs> nobody gets their name. Yeah. Nobody gets any information about them. And there is no reinforcement of this inappropriate, aberrant behavior mm. for in the terrorist context, in the context of uh, abnormal acts mm -hmm. and exactly what you're saying. These people are reinforced because how terrible it would otherwise be yeah. if they did not get recognized mm -hmm. in some kind and of I'm way. And I'm sure the media would say, well, the public has an interest in knowing who they are. Yeah. The public has an interest in number 16473A. <laughs> and that's who it is. Yeah. And what is he? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he, we arrested him and they might be able mm -hmm. to give certain demographics, which yeah. are very broad, but nothing beyond that. Mm -hmm. So not mental illness. Axis six. Do not reinforce and recognize that there is a certain spirituality in all of this. We've spoken about the evil. What about the good? What about the people who acted against these evils? What about mm -hmm. most of the population who are nice members? Mm -hmm. But what about the evil obedience as well? Yeah. 
So it's well, a complex area. You you are a psychiatrist, you're a man of science, uh, and yet I know you have delved into many spiritual questions, and I know from uh, looking at the history of religions on this planet, there are some religions, I think Buddhism generally, where they would say there is no such thing as absolute evil, it's just ignorance. And then there are others who would say, uh, like the Gnostics, who would say that the there's a spiritual war going on, and we are the battlefield, and the forces of good and evil are battling for control over our psyches. And, and then there are others, uh, Christians, who would say, well, God is all good, but God created Satan. Satan is a... Yeah, instrument of God, that he serves a, a divine purpose of some sort. Yeah, there's this whole variant all the way through. Mm -hmm. And I think fundamental to every religion is the concept of good and evil. Yeah. Fundamental to every religion is the concept of some kind of deity. And fundamental to every religion, as far as I know, is some kind of concept of survival after bodily death, yeah. which for some ends up as punishment, and for others ends up as reward, and in other uh, incarnations or reincarnations as a reincarnation and one's own punishment and uh, a in a next life. Yeah. But these are all fundamental variants, and good and evil is fundamental in religion, and yet it is so separated mm -hmm. in psychology, psychiatry, mm -hmm. and medicine. You know, um, in Buddhism, there is a story of uh, a man who was known as the finger necklace bandit. And he was a bandit at the time of the Buddha who murdered people, and then he chopped off their fingers and wore a necklace made of all of their fingers. So he's a very ferocious kind of person. And he met the Buddha, and uh, the Buddha converted him. He became a Buddhist monk, and for thereafter only uh, performed deeds of penance and and goodness. But he was never, to my knowledge, punished. Yeah, and this is a wonderful point mm -hmm. because again, in all the religions, there are variants of how to do this yeah. and different kinds of dogmas. Mm -hmm. But besides the inappropriate or evil act, there are ways to repent. Mm -hmm. And one sees this in all the major religions. Yes, in fact, the very notion of the penitentiary, as I recall uh, from my background in criminology, comes out of the Catholic Church and the notion of penitence. And then, of course, there's this narrow range between going to hell and to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> and who goes to hell and heaven? <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. do dogs... Do other animals yeah. deserve such components? Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as doggy heaven, and is it the same heaven, so to say, yeah. or the same hell? Mm -hmm. Well, those are questions that perhaps, uh, actually, psychical researchers may eventually uh, develop some uh, empirical, empirically-based answers for. I think so. Mm -hmm. But I gather, as a psychiatrist, you're, when you talk about an additional access of good and evil as part of psychiatric diagnosis, you're suggesting uh, primarily, I think, that uh, these people must be held accountable for their behavior. To a large degree. You know, we talk about the psychopathology as axis one. And then axis two is the big one that sometimes one puts in all these things like psychopath, borderline personality disorder. And then, of course, one's changed the term to antisocial personality disorder for the mm -hmm. psychopath. That's axis two. And axis three mm -hmm. and four relate to one's medical levels and one's level of psychosocial functioning. Mm -hmm. And the, with the axis five and these these are all components that are highly relevant, yeah. but nowhere in the diagnostic nomenclature will you find that axis 6. And in fact, I think there's an axis 7 as well, and that is the ultimate pharmacological response mm. to medication, mm -hmm. because psychiatry is an art more than a science as I'm seeing it without that, because there's a biochemical component. Yeah. Well. The insanity defense, to my understanding, is becoming rather rare. Uh, 
these days. Uh, it's not used much, but there are many other defenses for uh, acts of murder. I recently read about something called the uh, gay threat defense, where if, if you murder somebody who is uh, homosexual because you th are threatened by the fact that they are making uh, advances towards you, uh, you can uh, get a reduced charge, maybe manslaughter instead of murder. Yes, and then one goes all the way through in that hierarchy, mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately one can say, you know, they have that long nose or that short nose or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting to see how sometimes the law can distort. Personally, I don't like to do that medical legal work. Mm -hmm. I will only do civil work mm -hmm. because I sometimes get contacted by attorneys you know, we've got this rapist here, we've got this arsonist, we've got this murderer, and we think there is a defense, and there might well be. Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, I've got this conflict, this approach avoidance conflict. On the one hand, I want to help the person who might then be my patient or the perpetrator, and on the other hand, I want to protect society and what is right. Mm -hmm. And so I've opted out there, but you're 100% right. People find all sorts of reasons for inappropriate actions, and it's not only murders or acts of aggression, of mm -hmm. course. I mean, these days we have stand-your-ground laws. I heard of a case recently where a fellow going to a Halloween party, he was dressed in a costume, and he went to the wrong address and knocked on the door and kept knocking, dressed in this Halloween costume. It was Halloween, and the owner of the house felt threatened and shot him and killed him and uh, wasn't even prosecuted. Intriguing. Yeah. And, of course, in another context, the owner would have been prosecuted. Yeah. And, of course, you read about these burglars who come through the ceiling and they fall down and they break their leg and they sue the owner of the house <laughs> for not having proper protection. Yeah. But, the, you know, it's this whole extent. And all I am saying is we've got to recognize religiously, medically, psychologically, that there is more in terms of action. And ultimately, to me, one of the concepts is spiritual progression and growth mm -hmm. and transcendence of self mm -hmm. and recognition of good actions and obviously degrees of good and evil. Dr. Vernon Neppe, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on these issues. I can see as a forensic psychiatrist, you've really struggled uh, with these deep and important questions. That is true. And as a human being, I've struggled as well. Thank you for being with me. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.